litigation issues involving children in estate planning. That's the subject of today's ACTEC Trust and Estate Talk. Welcome to ACTEC Trust and Estate Talk from the American College of Trust and Estate Council, a professional society of peer elected trust and estate lawyers. This series offers professionals best practice advice, insights, and commentary on subjects that affect our profession and clients. And now, our ACTEC fellow host with today's topic. This is Susan Snyder, ACTEC fellow from Chicago. Most clients who engage in planning want to benefit future generations. Members of those future generations are frequently minors and young adults, which always creates unique circumstances, but more so when the governing trust or estate is embroiled in litigation. To learn more about this topic, you'll be hearing today from ACTEC fellows, Ray Koenig of Chicago, and Bob Sachs of Los Angeles. Welcome, Bob and Ray. Thank you. This is Bob Sachs. There are numerous issues that come up when minors are involved in trust and estate litigation. One of the most significant issues for lawyers is how do we ensure that minor children are bound by the outcome of the dispute, and particularly if there's a settlement that, that other parties are, are coming up with. One approach is the doctrine of virtual representation. And under the doctrine of virtual representation, courts uh, permit parents or others to step in into the shoes for their children because their interests are aligned. And because they are aligned, there is no conflict between the parent and the child. In that situation, the parent can then act on behalf of the child because their actions are helping both the parent and the child in the court's view. Another approach, which comes up probably more frequently and addresses the possible conflict between the parent and the child, is having a guardian ad litem appointed to act on behalf of the one or more minors in the, in the litigation. Guardians ad litem fulfill a really unique role because, at least under California law, they are termed as not really a lawyer and not really a party. They act on behalf of the ward, but they are not essentially the party in litigation as such. At the same time, they aren't really acting as a lawyer. They are, uh, they are in, in an interesting role representing the ward in a combination of a lawyer slash party relationship. Lawyers are often appointed to serve as guardians ad litem, so for the lawyers in the audience who might consider this, you should look into your state law because Guardians ad litem are often considered quasi-judicial officers. Because of that, they can enjoy a quasi-judicial immunity uh, against possible claims by a ward. Also, under California law, because a guardian ad litem is not the lawyer for the ward, they are not subject to legal malpractice claims. So, guardians ad litem perform a unique role in litigation in terms of trying to protect minors. They are very different, though, from what courts often appoint counsel to represent a party in litigation. Uh, appointed counsel is an advocate for that party, and their job is to assess the party's views, to try to express those views to the court as an advocate. And the lawyer's personal views are not at issue. But a guardian ad litem is asked by the court, what is in the best interests of this ward? And so, in that role, they are acting very differently from appointed counsel. And it's important to make sure that you understand what your role is and that the court understands what your role is, because even judges don't always understand this. Sometimes judges will say, I'm appointing you as, quote, best interests counsel, which I think they're really looking at a guardian ad litem role, because if you're supposed to express what the lawyer believes is in the best interests of the client, you're not advocating for the client in effect, although one could argue you are. Uh, you are expressing your personal views, which is more, more suited to a guardian ad litem. In terms of the powers of a guardian ad litem, they do have the power to bind their ward into a settlement. Their power is not absolute. For example, they, they cannot waive a right to a trial if that's something a ward may have been interested in but they can make tactical decisions such as waiving a right to a jury trial. So although the power of a guardian ad litem in acting on the ward is not absolute, clearly, as you can tell, they have very, very broad powers to act for their wards, and certainly in the context of trust and estate litigation can bind them. Thanks, Bob. 
<clears throat> this is Ray Koenig speaking now. Um, let's move on to um, a time when, let's say, a miner's estate or a trust is created, and the miner's estate or the trust are created for the benefit of the miner, or at least the, the, the miner benefits in some way from the trust. Uh, a common issue that is experienced by fiduciaries is uh, when parents of the miner um, want in some way to live off the miner's assets, either in the estate or the trust, um, and, and the issue becomes for the fiduciary, um, and of course counsel for the fiduciary, what can you do to help the parent, and how can you distribute money to benefit the parent, um, and, and other laws on it? Of course, there are laws on it. So looking at the, uh, the estate aspect of it, and not the trust, because trusts are governed differently, um, and looking at, I, I looked at uh, three larger states, Illinois, New York, and California, and uh, uh, under all three of them, um, it's pretty much the, the court uh, decides what's, how the money can be spent. So it's all by court order. Um, the guardian generally cannot make these decisions on their own. They make recommendations to the court. The court decides. What does the court have to do? The court has to decide it's in the best interests of the ward. Um, and, but it can be, under Illinois law, um, and New York and California seem to be similar, um, the best interest can be deemed pretty broadly, and not just for the direct benefit of the minor, and sometimes it can, it can benefit those around them. And some examples of, of where that happens, some common examples, where um, there's an incidental benefit from the minor's estate for the parent, and those of us that practice in Syria know sometimes it's really pushed for the benefits of the parents, but some of the common areas would be when the estate purchases a home for the minor. Say uh, the minor has a, a, a large estate due to a personal injury settlement, med mal, something like that, um, and in, in the millions, uh, and the parents were you know wage workers they didn't make much they don't have much um, and they were living in a small one bedroom rental can the estate spend money to benefit the minor but also benefits the parents the answer i mean it's much more complicated than just saying yes or no but the answer is usually yes if it's a benefit to the minor but it's also incidentally benefit the parents and that's completely acceptable another one is is when the family can't afford a car or can't afford an appropriate car for the minor when they need a special type of car, a, a, like a handicap accessible one. That's pretty common. And another pretty common one, though um, I will tell you in my experience, judges, judges usually grant them while cringing, um, is paying for a family vacation. Um, if the minor has funds and will benefit from a vacation, why can't the minor go on vacation? And you have to pay somebody to go with them to take care of them. Usually there's a disability or they're a minor. And then you pay, you know, you can usually get at least one parent paid for to go on the trip, and depending on the side of the state, you can sometimes get other family members paid for as well. Um, and it's a benefit to the, to the minor. All of these, of course, depend on how much money is in the estate, um, and, and, what, and, and a lot of it depends on the judge you're standing in front of and how they feel about these sorts of things. So in, in, in trusts, it's very different, uh, and obviously under trust law, it depends on the trust document itself. You would look to the document to see what you as fiduciary can or can't do, but most good drafters will give a trustee a great deal of discretion um, to make decisions here, and the trustees will usually, in my experience, if their assets are there, go a little bit further than, than a court would, and the other big difference is that in a trust, you don't need a court order. Um, you never want to see a court if you're in a trust because you don't want somebody coming after you as, as a fiduciary. Um, so, and before we move on to the next topic, I think it's important to, to talk a little bit about some things that a fiduciary can do or the attorney for the fiduciary can do when dealing with the parents. Um, some things you need to do is just man, manage the expectations of parents. Let them know from day one what the standard is and what can or can't be done, generally. They're gonna want a lot more detail than, than you can give them because they're gonna wanna get hypotheticals or get answers to hypotheticals and you can't usually give those, um, or at least to the, the ones they want. Um, make sure to involve all relevant players in the conversation. Get the parents in the room, talk to them. If the minor's old enough, have the minor in the room. Just see, have a conversation about these things so everybody's on the same page. Another one is use the court to your advantage. Um, meaning if you have a disagreement with the parents and you can go to court, avail yourself of the court. And as Bob said, you, you might get a GAL appointed who can help mediate this, this, the res, a resolution of this. And finally, um, as fiduciary, you have a duty to the beneficiary or you have a duty to, which in the minor's estate is the minor, or trust is the trust beneficiary. And remember, remember that and, and remember that compromise is key. Look for ways to compromise with them and getting, with getting everybody on board. Ray has made some very interesting points that can lead to another area for minors who maybe don't want their parents or guardians living off them. Uh, and this certainly comes up in California uh, and not infrequently with child actors uh, in particular. 
Uh, and the process that, uh, that dovetails with living off of your minor is the minor saying, I want to be emancipated. So I am now treated in most ways legally like an adult and mom and dad go live off your own funds. Uh, in California, minors may be emancipated because they are legally married when they're underage, under the age of majority of 18, um, if they join the U.S. military on active duty, uh, or if they go into court to be emancipated. That involves a petition uh, to the probate court, and if it's granted, the minors are treated just like adults in a host of ways in terms of making consent for medical treatment, psychiatric treatment, entering into binding contracts, and certainly in terms of filing lawsuits in their own name or being sued in their own name. This also means that if your client is an emancipated minor, they are bound by any settlement they enter into. So emancipation is an issue that comes up not, not too frequently, but certainly in cases where a minor does have a, a, a vast, usually storehouse of assets from something and wants to often protect their assets uh, from, from parents or others who would like to live off them. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Ray, for your thoughts on these unique issues dealing with children in litigation. Thank you for listening to Act Tech Trust and Estate Talk, the podcast about wealth planning matters from the American College of Trust and Estate Council. To find an Act Tech lawyer near you, visit actec.org. Please subscribe to this station on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Act Tech Talk.